When I was a boy in Poland uh, under the Russian regime, you know, it was a little bit hard to imagine alternative futures. It was straight up forbidden. But we were kids, we didn't care about that. And, uh, you know, one day we were watching the sky, um, me and my friend, just lying there, and uh, what did we see? What do you see? It's just a black canvas, white dots, right? But my friend, he actually saw something else. He read a comic book, a foreign comic book, sci-fi book. He saw alien civilizations, time travel, and all sorts of space adventures. And maybe this was the first time I realized what a designer can do. Um, someone with imagination that, you know, articulate something that you couldn't see before. He gave me a whole toolbox to understand what we could do as creative adventurers, as humans. This is maybe why I became a designer later in my life, imagining alternative futures. And I think this is important. Um, because, as my friend Stellan Christiansson, also a designer, once said, we will spend the rest of our life in the future. So, maybe you should get it right. And I think future comes in different sorts of ecosystems. Ecosystems that we hopefully will want to live in. Um, like, you know, owning a car, that will be absolutely disrupted. Uh, it will be a system similar to Spotify. Mobility will be a service. It will come ubiquitous. It will be everywhere, maybe even for free. We talked about energy earlier today. It's a system of innovations that will change our lives forever. And I think we need to understand it, because we're already doing it. We have sensors today that maybe can connect with interfaces to our brain to transmit our feelings, our thoughts. So as a boy, I dreamt of science fiction. It was great. This summer, I met Joe Sercel, very interesting guy. He worked for NASA for 17 years. Then he started his own. He's building a machine, that's right, that goes out in space, captures asteroids, and squeezes out whatever can be rocket fuel of, uh, of the asteroid with the help of solar beams. <laughs> that's a cool job, no? Uh, and, and, you know, it's not because that's cool. He has a grander, bigger idea. He thinks that industrialization of space is already happening. We will have a railroad for space travel in our solar system, open to humanity, so we need gas stations. And this is how, how he thinks this chain of designs will be a coherent design. And if you think about it, this is the stuff of Hollywood movies, no? And we see this movement from science fiction to science fact, to design, to reality. Because once we sit down and start to imagine something, and then articulate it in a way that we can understand it and see it, we go for it. But it's really, really hard. Because change is, for the first, exponential. So the opportunities and the difficulties are also exponential. And you and I, we already take decisions every day about stuff, about school and job and so on. These decisions, if you think about it, shape our future. Together, as a sum, they are bigger than just one decision. Unfortunately, we don't realize it always. We are somehow disconnected. We move without this grander design of an experience we want to have in the future. Maybe the future will just happen to us, in the worst case. Or maybe SpaceX or Google will make it. Or maybe the next US president <laughs> will shape it alone. Uh, so, you know, we are a little bit lost, and we hope that someone else will connect the dots, because we do imagine life that is good decades from now, the future, but we cannot visualize it. We cannot connect the dots alone. And I think you've seen it. You've probably been in projects in school, in that work, in your family, where everything is running very fast in very different directions. Um, I once worked uh, on a project where we tried to connect a really good pocket camera with a really good mobile phone. So, as, as, as he said, I'm a little bit old-ish. Um, but that's what we wanted to do. 
Um, so we worked very hard. The team started to bring in all sorts of innovations um, in there and try to, you know, the, the biggest lens we could have. Someone wanted to have a histogram in the display of the phone. Do you know what a histogram is? Oh, you do. Very, very few people do. It's so geeky. Um, and in the end, it became a monster of features stacked on each other in a small, tiny box that couldn't take it. So we have to sit down again and rethink, OK, what is the question? What is the human perspective of taking pictures? What is the best camera in the world, really? It's about sharing memories, right? I experienced this. I want to save it, cherish it, and share it. I want to capture that special moment. So the best camera in that moment is actually the one you have with you. And that changed everyone's perception in this project. We started to figure out what would be the best mechanical and optical solution to put in a pocket, to have it always there, make it really easy to open and fast. We started to look at features, how to connect the camera application to internet. Whoa. <laughs> really crazy. Because then you could blog directly from the camera. We were first ones to do it, actually. You know, to think like the future user made us very, very successful. We sold actually one phone every tenth second on the planet for a very short while. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, you could ask the same question today with, with the mobile phones we have. What is the best smartphone out there? I guess you have opinions. <laughs> I think it's the one that makes us smarter. One that is not just a phone, it builds a relationship to me as a human, leverages me. Because that's what it's all about. The next big thing is not a thing. It's a relation between these things. We can imagine these relations, imagine our behaviors, and the product will just follow. Because it's all about empathy. Empathy is a method and it's the biggest tool a designer can have. Luckily, for all of us, we all have it. We just have to practice it. When we have empathy, we can understand the future needs of anyone, right? And that's the tool. When you have that, that knowledge, you can build future products. So basically, a good designer is someone that can articulate and imagine desirable futures. It may be simple like an app or very complex like, you know, life on Mars. Um, and I think we need to be sort of a fusionist bringing together science, art, technology, and design to something that is coherent, that is tangible, so we can make it desirable. And, and that's very important, because once we can conduct and orchestrate the relationship of small pieces, everyone working on their small advancement into the future, a new innovation, and we can conduct and orchestrate them, it's about this connection of the disconnecting shapes that the future will have. It's up to us all to do this really, really well. And we need to start mapping the change around us. We need to start watching it and understanding it. Because together, all this changing will become our ultimate design brief. And we need to study it. Um, and I have some thoughts about these dots or thoughts that we need to connect together that might help us on this journey. John Maeda said once, he's a creative entrepreneur, um, I'm not here to fix pixels. I'm here to find out what is the biggest business impact design can have. Because designers are trained in making something new that has an impact. For me, that's the best uh, description of innovation I ever heard. And innovation, as you know, is a huge business driver. Design is a business strategic activity. So put it on your board level, like many other companies have already done. Venture capitalists, for example, uh, hire designers. Uh, we have big tech firms that already uh, acquire whole design firms, like Facebook, because they have understood they have to gain this creative confidence to innovate well. Speaking of creative confidence, um, anybody ever dreamt of, you know, being an artist, playing in a band, but maybe didn't have this creative confidence? I was one, two. Yeah, see, half of you. 
The rest of you probably play in a band, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we, we lived in Poland, and that wasn't sustainable in any way. So my parents fled to Sweden, and I was a teenager, and I ma made a new friend. And I discovered rock and roll music, free music, and punk rock was the best of them all. This, this is, you should listen more to punk rock, by the way. So Max had a band, and he needed a guitar player, and he asked me, but I didn't feel I was the creative type. And he said, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. He put a guitar in my lap and showed me three chords. And he said, when you know these three chords, chords you can write any punk song. It's going to be a hit. So I practiced, and I could barely play these three chords, right? Um, but I, it was fun. We were friends, right? So, so I started to experiment. I tried to stretch my fingers as far apart as I could on the fretboard and tried to see how that sounded. And it sounded terrible. So I asked, Max, is this a chord? And he looks, yeah, now it is. <laughs> you know, we had this creative confidence between each other. We really allowed us to fail to learn from that and go again. We had this culture. Because when the world is ever-changing, we need to be ever-learning. And that's the glue. That's the glue for your business strategy, for your product strategy. You can build your innovation team or a design team, the best you, you want. But design is not a department. It's a culture. So you need to allow for that culture and support it. You need to look for uh, creativity, empathy, learnability. That's your new business intelligence. Intelligence, and you need to get everybody very, very involved. Everybody. Because, you know, design is just too important to be left only to designers. We need help. And um, we need help in all sorts of directions. We have big problems. Poverty, flying to space, diseases. All these things need to be solved. And I think we have already a piece of this help going on. I call it the Hue Machine. Basically, it's a symbiosis between us, uh, human creativity and machine intelligence. And when we combine it, which we do already when we run our companies, uh, run our, our finances and logistics and all these things that these machines make a little bit efficient. And they do it well and it's great and it's going to be better and it's going to be automated. Great! Because then we can focus making new software cognitive support, intelligent support for human activities, like storytelling, sharing experiences, finding consensus. You know, the big problems need human creative solutions. Because creativity is not, you know, sitting and adjusting margins in your Word document. The, the creativity is writing a really nice love letter or maybe a business contract if you want. You know, that's the real job to be done. And we can move from this analy analytical, mechanical labor that we leave to the machines to, to, to jobs, you know, worth doing. And we can move the political debate from if people's movement around the globe is good or bad. Because it's great. We know this already. Machines can tell us that. There's statistics. We can instead start to discuss how innovation is driven by globalization. And it's activism. It's true activism. We design artifacts like this one. Artifacts shape our behavior, right? Behaviors shape societies. Societies shape politics. Well, design is political. Singapore already said, we want to be a design-thinking nation. World Economic Forum is saying that in the year 2020, which is quite soon, by the way, the new workforce best skill will be creativity. And I bet you, not much, but a little bit, say 10 bucks, that in 10 years, no, I, I can bet more. <laughs> we can talk about it later. In 10 years, we will have a politician, government level, a minister, say, of education, with a strong design background. Here in Germany, probably in Canada. So here, here's what I'm saying. 
Let's map and connect our decisions. Let's understand that change, because that's the shape of our future. That's our design brief. Let's be more rock and roll. <laughs> I mean, seriously, take chances, be bold. Because that's how you fail, <laughs> and that's how you learn, and that's how you innovate. And allow technology to be, us more, to be, to be more human for us. Let technology do the labor of analytic stuff so we can focus on what really matters. Creativity is a medium for all of us. So let's map, build, and inspire a future that we really, really want to live in. Thank you.